Disclaimer, before watching this video, I need you to know that I am in no way glorifying the atrocities that are still occurring to this day that I talk about in the Siege Operator concept. I'm using my platform and storytelling to create an operator that has gone through some of the worst things humanity has to offer at this time. If you're someone who doesn't think you'd enjoy graphic storytelling, then click away. But I encourage you to listen to this story to spread awareness. Again, I am not glorifying this. Hey everybody, Jep here, and I've made a brand new operator concept with the lore story in Rainbow Six Siege. You guys really love my last operator concept on Hope, with overwhelmingly positive comments, so I decided to make another operator concept. The one I made for today's video has a good chance at getting demonetized with how graphic and brutal the storyline is. It's a real world issue that is still going on to this day and upsets me to my core. So I thought I could spread awareness while creating a great operator I can't wait to share with you guys. The operator I came up with call sign will be called Diamond. I'll go into his complete loadout with the lore story and gadget idea for you guys. He'll be an attacker on Team Rainbow, but first, as we always do, we need to start with where and when Diamond was born. So Diamond's real name is actually Tabu Mdaka, and he was born on September 9th, 1986 in the country of Sierra Leone. This country is going to play a major role in the terrible and inhumane upbringing Tabu would have. Tabu was born into a small village of only about 200 people, with most of the village being rice farmers and surviving off the income from the farm. Pretty much as soon Tabu can walk, he started tending to the farm underneath his mom and dad's supervision. When Tabu was four years old, he got a little brother named Amari. They grew up together, and since there wasn't that many kids around Tabu's age growing up, sometimes all he had to relate with and play with was Amari. Life was very difficult but manageable for the young boys growing up. Their village and family was extremely poor, but if the kids were hungry enough, they'd sneak out to get some of the rice that was stored. Tabu and Amari did everything together. They'd play, work, eat, and learn together. Tabu's mom would do the best she could at teaching her children how to read and write. With literacy in the country of Sierra Leone being one of the lowest in the world, there weren't many people in the village that could actually read and write. As if running a farm just to barely make ends meet wasn't hard enough, there was a constant threat to the village of warlords and cartels raiding the village. So far, Tabu's family and village has been safe as no warlords or cartels have raided the village yet. Tabu's mom would have to explain to the young boys that it isn't safe to leave their land. Sierra Leone was in a massive civil war at the time with the blood diamond trade growing in the country. Warlords and cartels would raid villages, steal young children to brainwash them, turning them into child soldiers and taking the able-bodied men as slaves mining for diamonds. She would explain that sometimes they would come, take just a few people and leave without harming anyone, but other times it would arrive and maim or kill many people in the village. Unfortunately, this would terrorize Tabu and Amari as they were always wondering when the sounds of trucks and AK-47s would come up the road ready to take anyone they wanted. It was necessary though to prepare the kids on what may happen. Tabu was 10 years old at the time while his younger brother Amari was 6. Tabu's dad asked if he could spend the morning out in the field tending to the farm. It was hot, but he didn't mind because it gave him something to do instead of being bored. Amari was up in the village eating breakfast and going over how to write the alphabet when all of a sudden, off in the distance, the sounds of engines started growing louder and louder. Tabu couldn't make it out at first. But then he saw what it was. Four pickup trucks loaded with people started barreling down the road to the village, firing AK rounds up in the air as they got closer. Tabu knew that he needed to get back to the village now to hopefully get into the hiding place under their house that his father dug in case a raid ever came. But the trucks were much faster. They stopped in the middle of the village as the dust kicked up from the trucks obscured the center of the village. Without a moment's notice, they jumped out of the truck and fired upon the people. As Tabu was sprinting up to the house, he heard the screams and gunfire as everyone he knew was dropping from the bullets. After about 20 seconds of open fire, they stopped and ordered everyone left into the center of the village. Tabu finally got to his home to find his grandparents dead and his family missing. He opened up the hidden hatch and no one from his family was in there. That means they must have been captured. Just as he was nearing his way to the center of the village, he heard a few gunshots. Panic set in as he rushed to see what happened. The warlords were demanding the children of the village to shoot and kill the older people. 
Just then, he saw one of them shove an AK into Amari's hands and ordered him to take fire on a blindfolded man. Tabu screamed and cried as he ran up to Amari and took the AK from his hands. He was about to do something he would remember for the rest of his life to protect his younger brother. After he grabbed the AK, he turns to the kneeling man and pulled the trigger. The warlord slapped Tabu in the face but told him, Protecting your brother is a very brave and noble act. I respect you, young boy, but I'll need you to come with me. You will have a new life now, as I raise you to be a strong man. You will learn to obey me and never again stop something I want done. Tabu looked at his brother, too shocked to even cry, as they loaded him into the bed of the lead truck and drove away. Kicking up dust as the horrifying vision of the now decimated village slowly faded away. Life would never be the same for Taboo. Immediately upon arrival at the camp, they beat him, starved him, and trained him to be a warrior while constantly telling him this is to make him a strong man. Learning how to be precise with his weapon, they slowly but tactfully brainwashed Taboo into becoming a child soldier, telling him lies that his family never loved him and how they are his new family now. He had to remind himself who his family even was and that they did in fact love him. He was eventually shown the mining operation that was happening at the camp captured and enslaved people from other local villages were grouped up here and forced to sift through streams looking for diamonds or mining the ground in search of diamonds as well anyone who did not comply would be tortured or killed in an effort to dehumanize the child soldiers often the task of torture was given to them sometimes taboo would just have to cut off a finger but if punishments were more severe he'd have to do even worse things that he'd rather not relive by telling the stories. Pretty soon, Taboo was a shell of his former self, emotionless and willing to comply with any order given to him just to avoid punishment or death. Some time went by, and four years later, Taboo was 14 years old now. He would now take part in the raiding parties as well, doing the same unspeakable acts of violence he experienced four years ago to the other villages all in the name of diamonds. The blood diamonds, or sometimes called conflict diamonds, are very popular in the area. Taboo would experience firsthand how the diamonds of the captured villagers would find would be directly sold to companies looking to make profits in Western countries, unaware of the true origins on where the diamonds came from. With years of brainwashing from his captors, Taboo would eventually believe the lies they told him. Your family doesn't love you. We are your family. You have no purpose than to be a soldier. You have no meaning in life, are all examples of what he was told day in and day out. Tabu, as sick as it sounds, was brainwashed in such a way that he would look forward to raiding villages now or torturing the people working in the mines. He wanted to be one of the best of his peers and stand out amongst them. So he developed a device that would impress the captors he called his family now. After a ton of trial and error, he crafted a small container filled with the ground up mineral powder that binded to surfaces very easily as a way to ensure the captured miners would stay where they are or a way to track people during village raids if they were trying to run away. He explained how this slightly electrically charged mineral powder would bind to human flesh very easily and if spread around a person, it would enter their lungs and act as a respiratory irritant. It wouldn't necessarily hurt them, but it would make them cough very, very frequently as well as coat their skin in this white powder, making it easier to track them via footsteps or simply by looking for people with powder all over their body. The warlord leaders immediately went to the mine and threw some of the powder onto the miners and almost immediately they began coughing loudly and making footprints all around the area that would eventually fade away after about 30 seconds. It was an incredible device to ensure people would not leave out of fear of being caught by either the audible loud coughing that, that would happen about every 10 seconds or the footprints left behind, leaving a track if they were to run. But one day shortly after Taboo's 17th birthday, 
He was starving as they would frequently keep the soldiers very hungry to ensure they'd stay with them to guarantee a next meal. Tabu couldn't take it anymore, so he stole some scraps of food that was not offered to him. He was caught. Tabu was expecting a punishment unlike he's ever gone through before, worse than the branding or beating with stones. He braced for it, but it never came. Instead, the leader grabbed his hand, took him to the back of the pickup truck, and set off on the road. A few hours of driving later and Tabu was exhausted, but began to recognize where he was. As he went over the hill, he realized that they were heading directly to his old village where he used to live now seven years ago. The people panicked as the truck stopped in the middle of the village just like it did seven years ago. The leader demanded that Tabu's younger brother to meet him in the center in exactly 60 seconds and yelled it out, or he'll kill everybody. He began counting down. 60, 59, 58, 57. Shortly after, Tabu's little brother emerged from one of the buildings and walked towards the center. Tabu finally got to see Amari for the first time in seven years. The leader took out his sidearm, walked up to Tabu, shoved it in his hands, and demanded his little brother to kneel. It has been seven years since he's seen his brother Amari, and the first time he gets to see him will be his last. Terrified, Tabu raised the gun in his shaking hands and aimed it at Amari. The leader began counting down again, but this time from 10. Tabu locked eyes with his brother as they were both crying. He didn't want to do this. He shot many, many people in the past, but please not my brother. 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Amari looked up and saw Tabu with smoke escaping from the barrel aimed at the leader of the camp and heard a thud as he hit the ground. Tabu quickly turned around to the two other blood diamond captors that went with them in the truck and swiftly shot them too. Making sure they were all dead, he ran up to his brother and hugged him in a warm embrace he hasn't been able to do since they took him away from the same from this very village seven years ago. But their time together at the village will be short lived. They must now steal the truck hide the bodies, and leave as soon as they can. They must leave the country to ensure they would be safe together because the warlords at the camp would hunt them down no matter what if they were to stay. So they drove far, far away. They drove so far away, all the way to the Atlas Mountains in Northern Africa. Across vast deserts and isolated villages, they were low on water, food, and fuel. They saw a massive building on top of a mountain, and since that was the only structure in sight, they drove to the mountain. Just outside this big building, there was a very tall and extremely muscular man standing at the doors. They got out of the truck, walked up to the man, and knelt in front of him. Tabu gave him his name and explained everything they've gone through and how they were on the run from the blood diamond trade. After a couple minutes of them pleading to get some help, the muscular man only said one word. Wait. He walked inside, leaving the brothers out. After a few moments, the doors opened up again but this time, the man was accompanied by another tall, this time pretty old-looking man. The old man walked up to the brothers and introduced himself as Jalal Al-Fasi and introduced the muscular man as Saif Al-Hadid. But you can just call us Kaid and Oryx instead. The brothers got up in joy and they were brought inside the building. Kaid began telling them that this building is a very important military training structure called the Fortress and that if they were to stay, they must undergo training even though they weren't 18 yet. They agreed and quickly undergone training at Kaid's fortress. It was unlike anything they've ever seen before. With only living in tiny villages or camps, it was strange to have food and water easily accessible and even air conditioning. Tabu would quickly advance the ranks of the fortress as he's been living in a grueling life so training for the military wasn't very hard. Oryx and Kaid would take him under his wing as they saw the potential in Tabu. Tabu would often tell stories of what he had to do while at the camp 
and would look for guidance from the wise Kaid on how to live with himself, knowing everything he's done. He feels guilty, ashamed, and horrified when looking back on his life. But somehow, Kaid found a way to break through to him and explain that while he cannot change his past, he can change his future. So that's exactly what Taboo did. He would do everything in his power to right his wrongs he has done. He would make an oath that he would one day be able to go back to the camp that he was kept at for so many years and bring justice to the people there. Flash forward a few years and it's now present day. Taboo is now a high ranking officer at the fortress and his brother is also an intelligence officer for the fortress as well. Kaid is granted the use of the AK-47, a weapon Taboo is very familiar with, the Bailiff's secondary pistol, as well as flash grenades and a claymore to choose from. Also, Taboo found a way to replicate the white mineral powder device he would craft in the past and would name it the Tracking and Mineral Respiratory Irritant Device, or Tamrid for short. But Taboo would always wonder why Kaid and Oryx would sometimes spend long periods of time away from the fortress. One day he went up and finally asked him where they were going all the time, and Oryx turned to Kaid for the answer, where he simply replied, why don't you come with us and find out? So he hopped onto the plane and took off with them. A couple hour flight later and they landed. Then when getting off the plane, Taboo has never seen so many people in one area before. He asked Kaid where they were and he said, Greece. They got into a private military vehicle and drove throughout the city they were in. Taboo just stared out the window watching all the other cars go by and the so many buildings he was seeing. He's never seen so many people just so happy before without a care in the world walking around without any worries of safety it's something that he has never got to experience in his life they finally arrived at this massive building they got out and walked up a long staircase to the entrance where a man with glasses and a briefcase was waiting for them the man shook hands with Kaid and Oryx and walked to Taboo and asked Taboo politely gave the man his name and the man responded with well it's a pleasure to meet you Taboo my name is Dr. Harishva Pandey well, you can just call me Harry. Would you like to come in? Absolutely, said Taboo as they walked inside. Harry showed Kaid and Oryx, along with Taboo, the new improvements to the program and the stadium that they wanted to see. This place was amazing, and Taboo got a weird feeling inside that, oddly enough, felt like home. He told this Harry guy what he was feeling inside, and Harry stopped, turned around, and with a smile on his face said, well, do you have any military or police experience? Taboo gave in and spilled out his entire life story to Harry. Everything, his life at the village, his time spent as a child soldier, and all the things he had to do there, and even his time he spent at the fortress with Kaid and Oryx. Everything. He was waiting for Harry to respond with something along the lines of, the things you've done have no place here at Team Rainbow, or even worse, you're a bad man. But instead, Harry paused, looked up at Taboo, and said, I am a person that believes in second chances. You got dealt a bad hand in life, and I can tell that you are not the same person you once were. So how about life finally gives you a fair chance? Will you like to join us here on Team Rainbow? Tears ran down Taboo's face as he shook Harry's hand. Harry gave him the call sign of Diamond based off his life story and commitment to ending the blood diamond trade. He brought Taboo to the research and development lab where he met Mira for the first time as she found a way to equip Taboo's timer device to the bottom of his AK-47 and added a launching mechanic to it similar to Nomad's air jabs. That way Taboo could simply launch a timer device into a room to spread a cloud of the white mineral dust into the air making enemies cough be covered in the white powder making it easy to see them and also leaving footprints if they were to leave it doesn't damage anyone but ensures that ear takes the lungs just enough to make a loud audible cough about every 10 seconds taboo thanked mira as she finished testing out the prototypes just as taboo was about to find his barracks he bumped into a woman walking down the hallway as they both said sorry multiple times but she turned to him and said wait i don't recognize you what, what's your name I'm Lucia Mirendez, and I'm pretty new here, but I'm loving it so far. My call sign is Hope. Uh, who are you? 
Tabu smiled and said, my name is Tabu Mdaka and my call sign is Diamond. Hope went on and asked, wait, Diamond, why is your call sign Diamond? And Tabu closed his eyes and said, I took an oath to stop something that means very, very much to me. And I won't stop until it's extinguished. Well, everyone, what do you think about Diamond's lore? Did you find it to be interesting or felt the underlying message of his lore to be powerful? Also, what do you think about his gadget and weapon loadout? And, and should I make more of these operator concepts like this one? Let me know by leaving a comment down below. Also, if you did enjoy the video, make sure to leave a like and subscribe for notifications if you're new. Now, with all that being said, Jippy!